Good morning. Welcome to part two of uh, endocrine disorders of the pancreas, diabetes mellitus types one and two. We're going to pick up where we left off. So I will share my screen and let's go right to the PowerPoint and pick up where we left off. Okay, so we're going to start talking about medications. Medications for diabetes mellitus. So type 1 diabetics, if you recall, can only get insulin. Insulin is the only treatment. But for type 2, oral hypoglycemics, but then sometimes if they don't work, they can progress to insulin. So we've got different types of insulin. Long-acting, glargine and detamir, intermediate-acting and pH, short-acting, which is regular, and that one can be given subcutaneously or IV. That's the only one that can be given intravenously. And then your rapid acting, which is Lispro. Take a look at the next page, the next slide. Um, there's a nice little table here. It's going to make it nice and easy. These are the ones that you need to know. And I've listed the type of insulin, what the name is that you need to know, the onset, the peak, and the duration. And all of that's important information. Okay, so we've got rapid acting insulin, which is Lispro, and that one is rapid. 15 minutes is the onset. Peaks in about an hour or two hours, and it's going to last a couple of hours, three to four hours. Short acting, short acting or regular insulin is the one that you see utilized with sliding scales, where you'll see, you know, a patient's blood glucometer reading is this, give this much insulin. That's your regular insulin. Also can be given intravenously. Why? For diabetic ketoacidosis, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So anyway, make sure that you know these insulins, Lispro, Regular, NPH, Glargine, Detamir. Okay, they're the ones that you need to know by those names, the generic names. All right. This is an insulin pen. Um, insulin pens are fabulous. They have different types of insulin available in them. And instead of a vial of insulin, what you've got is a preloaded pen. And on the end, there's a little clicky thing. So let's say your, your dose is five units. One, two, three, four, five, click, 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 click. Five units, you put a disposable needle on it, administer it subcutaneously, boom. So that eliminates the necessity of drawing insulin out of a vial. Really great for some people. When we talk about the administration of insulin, it's important to remember it's subcutaneous. So it's going into fatty tissue, 45 degree angle, the gauge of the needle, which is the thickness of it, 22 to 28, and then a half inch to about three quarters of an inch. The sites of administration need to be rotated to prevent something called lipodystrophy. And lipodystrophy, lipo meaning fat, dystrophy meaning not working right. If you keep on administering a subcutaneous injection in the same spot over and over again, scar tissue will build up in that fatty tissue. And then at some point, there's so much scar tissue that there's no absorption. So the patient will administer insulin, but really not absorb it. So it's almost like they didn't get insulin at all. Make sure you know that. Okay. And then the regimens can be a basal bolus. Basal, the word basal, slow and steady. In other words, I'm going to give you, boom, a big bolus of this long acting insulin that's going to work long, slow, steady. And that's your glargine and your detamir. And then also your sliding scales for regular insulin, which we talked about. There are also now fabulous little things called insulin pumps. These are great for just 24 seven monitoring of blood sugar and administration of regular insulin on a sliding scale. That's what they do. So instead of the patient pricking their finger, this little gadget, is hooked up to them with a little needle, and you can see there's a kind of little patch here in the corner, and that gets attached somewhere on the abdominal area, and it is constantly checking their blood sugar, and it can administer insulin if necessary, which is fabulous. Then we have our orals. Now, oral hypoglycemics are not insulin, and how they work depends on the med. Sometimes they stimulate the pancreas to make insulin, Sometimes they increase the tissue sensitivity to insulin. Hey, and remember insulin is the Uber driver that takes the sugar from the blood and feeds it to the cells. So the tissue and cells have to be receptive or sensitive to that, okay? 
Um, they can sometimes slow carbohydrate digestion or absorption, or they can reduce glucose reabsorption by the kidneys. Okay? Um, the first one that you got to know, and you got to know metformin. Metformin. And what it does is it inhibits hepatic gluconeogenesis. In other words, remember insulin drives through the blood, grabs the sugar out of the blood, feeds it to the cells, and then if there's any sugar left, it'll take it to the liver to store it for later. Well, metformin won't let the liver release that blood sugar back in, okay? What can metformin also do as side effects? Well, I can give you a metallic taste in your mouth, no big deal, suck on some sugar-free hard candy. Can cause a side effect, an adverse effect called lactic acidosis. So you wanna tell your patient to report any new onset of muscle pain, muscle cramping immediately. That can be fatal. And then this is important. If the patient is having any procedure that uses contrast dye, that would include cardiac catheterization, angiograms, angiography, CT scan with contrast dye. They must hold that drug, metformin. They can't take it the day of and 48 hours after the procedure, or we will put them in renal failure. And that is a board question also. Know it, know it, know it. And then for the orals that you need to know, we have a carbose, and a carbose basically inhibits the body's absorption, the cell's absorption of sugar, right? And so you've got to take it with the first bite of every meal. And if hypoglycemia occurs, which means their blood sugar does go down low, they must not drink juice. They need to take dextrose or glucose tablets. It's the only thing that will bring their blood sugar back up, okay? The next must know med, and this is a other, it's an injectable, but it's not an insulin, and it is exenatide. And this one, here's what you need to know, it can cause pancreatitis. So you tell your patient, any new onset of a severe abdominal pain, report immediately. You don't want pancreatitis. Um, the next slide gives you kind of a, an example of a glucose diary. And you know, for people that are sticking their finger and administering regular insulin, this helps them track what their sugars have been and any notes that are applicable. You know, if they had a high blood sugar reading or a super low reading, why, what happened, okay? And urine testing. One of the things that we do is we will um, give patients dipsticks under certain circumstances to use at home. In other words, for them to take a urine specimen and put this dipstick in the urine to check for glucose or ketones, okay? Glucose dipsticking is not really used. If the patient's sticking their finger, they don't need to do that. But ketone urea, ketones in the urine, that is a sign of diabetic ketoacidosis, elevated blood sugar. We will give the patient dipsticks to use at home if they're feeling signs and symptoms of DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, and that's important for you to know. So patients can either get hyperglycemic, blood sugar is too high, or hypoglycemic, blood sugar is too low. It's also called an insulin reaction, but it's, you know, it's what insulin does, it lowers blood sugar, but sometimes it can lower it too much. So when we talk about hyperglycemia, for diabetics, I don't really like talking about <clears throat> a specific number because it's going to be different. So I'm getting rid of that, okay? So I'm just gonna say blood glucose is elevated for that patient because you will see different uh, readings for different patients, what, what's their baseline. And what can cause hyperglycemia? Well, they can eat the wrong things or too much. They can have a stressful event. They can be sick. Illness will cause hyperglycemia, or they simply don't have medication. Um, either they're not taking it or they can't afford it, but they're not taking their meds. And the symptoms, of hyperglycemia. Remember those three P's we talked about? It's polyuria, I pee a lot, polydipsia, I'm thirsty, and polythagia, I'm hungry. Those are the symptoms of hyperglycemia. But then the one thing that you wanna know that's important, I'm gonna add this in here, uh, don't forget, hot and dry, sugar is high. So you must remember that. And then they can have symptoms like blurred vision, fatigue, lethargy, a headache, abdominal pain, 
ketone urea, which with it comes flu-like symptoms. And that's that hot and dry, sugar's high, right? Um, so feverish, but you know, not clammy. And if we don't do anything and the sugar stays high in the blood, they can go into a coma and they can die. So that's important to know. And then, you know, how do we treat it? Well, check the blood sugar and use rapid acting or fast acting, short acting insulin, okay? What's the cause? Why is the blood sugar elevated? Okay, we need to figure it out. Is it because the medication regimen doesn't work? Is it because uh, they're not taking their medication or they can't afford to buy their medication? There are lots of different reasons. So we want to make sure that we are determining the cause of the hyperglycemia so that it doesn't happen again because it can be fatal. And then we have hypoglycemia. Okay, And again, I'm removing this number because it's different for different people. Okay. So when blood sugar for that person starts to become too low, and that can be why too much insulin, they exercised a little too much and they didn't eat enough, right? Because exercise uses up sugar. Um, these are all things that can cause hypoglycemia, which can be fatal as well. So blood sugar high, blood sugar low, either way, the result can be devastating, okay? And the symptoms of hypoglycemia, um, I'm gonna get rid of some stuff on this slide, but I'm gonna add some stuff. I'm not gonna worry about neuroglycopenia because you don't need to know that. But I'm gonna say cold and clammy, give them candy, give them candy. So in other words, if they're cold and clammy, diaphoretic, sweaty and cold, these are signs of hypoglycemia. They will get shaky. They'll feel hungry, they'll get a headache, they may get tremors or palpitations. All of these things are symptoms of hypoglycemia. So just remember that line. Hot and dry, sugar's high. Cold and clammy, give them candy, okay? And to treat hypoglycemia, well, check the blood sugar, make sure that that is what the problem is, and give them a fast-acting carb. Fast-acting carb, We're gonna bring the blood sugar up and then recheck them in about 15 minutes to make sure that the blood sugar has become back to, has gone back to its normal or what it needs to be for them to not be symptomatic. When I say give them a fast sugar, the usual, the typical is orange juice, four ounces of orange juice, really any fruit juice because fruit is loaded with sugar. Don't add sugar packets. Even, I know that some of you may have seen nurses do this in the past, please don't. You don't need to add sugar, there's enough sugar in the orange juice. Milk, milk has sugar in it. Regular soda has sugar in it. Raisins, commercial glucose tablets. You can buy tablets that are in a roll and you know if they need sugar, pop one in the mouth real quick, okay? And then if they're in trouble, then it's IV dextrose or subcutaneous glucagon. If you hear somebody say IV dextrose, they may say, give them D50, give them an amp of D50. That's what they're talking about. That's IV dextrose. And that is a, you know, a fast fix if somebody's blood sugar is so low that they're in danger, okay? Now we have diabetic ketoacidosis, also known as DKA. And this is important, okay, to understand and I'm gonna give you another little story to go with it. So what happens? Blood sugar is high. And it can happen most often with type 1 diabetics. Give you this scenario. Poor old Mrs. Jones, she's sick and tired of being a diabetic. And her granddaughter gets married. And they send her home with all this good stuff, including cake, right? All kinds of things that are bad for Mrs. Jones's diabetes. And she eats all of them at home, sitting in her living room watching her stories. Well, she eats all that stuff and her blood sugar goes up sky high. Remember, she's diabetic, so her pancreas isn't making insulin. There's no Uber driver to get the sugar out of the blood and feed the cells. So what happens? The cells are going, hey, I'm starving to death. There's nothing for them to eat because your cells, the mitochondria, need sugar. They need those carbs in order to make adenosine triphosphate, ATP, energy. So they go, well, there's no sugar to eat, so what am I going to do? I'm going to have to just burn fat. So they start burning 
that to make ATP, which is okay for a minute. But the byproduct of burning fat to make energy are ketones. And ketones are acetone, they're acidic, okay? So now you got poor Mrs. Jones sitting there in her living room and her blood sugar is 800. She's got no insulin and the cells are starving to death and they start breaking down the fat. Here you go, this is the pathophysiology, right? And when they do, the byproduct are these ketones, right? And so the ketones start to spill into the blood. When they do that, the blood pH starts to drop. Blood starts to become acidic. They're going into a metabolic acidosis. So as this is happening, the body recognizes that they start having all the symptoms of hyperglycemia. So hot and dry, sugar's high. They're super, super thirsty. They're peeing a lot. So polydipsy, polyuria. They're really, really hot, feverish, flu-like symptoms. And then a couple more things to add. They are going to have breath that smells like juicy fruit gum. You heard me correctly, okay? Breath that smells like juicy fruit gum. And their urine. Not that you're going to want to smell it, but um, fruity breath and urine. Their urine is going to smell like juicy fruit gum because even though the ketones are acetone or acidic, they have a fruity smell to them and it comes off their breath and their urine. They're going to go into something called Kussmaul respirations. What that is, the lungs, the whole body recognizes that they're going into acidosis, metabolic acidosis. And the lungs and the kidneys work together to try to maintain acid base balance. But the lungs can act fast. And the lungs go, uh oh, we're in trouble. The pH of the blood is dropping. What can we do? I know we can get rid of some carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is acidic. So the patient will go into this rapid, deep respiratory pattern to try to blow off carbon dioxide. <sighs> That's what it looks like. <clears throat> Kussmaul's respirations. Because their body has a compensatory mechanism, it's trying to save them. Usually it won't work. And if we don't do something to get the blood sugar down, and to get the pH of the blood back to normal, they're gonna have electrolyte imbalances and they're gonna wind up in a coma and dead. So this is when IV insulin is used to treat diabetic ketoacidosis, okay? Um, they're gonna get IV fluids, insulin drip, monitor their glucose, would we'll probably need electrolyte replacement. And remember, IV insulin, the only one, that's right, it's regular insulin. Okay, make sure you don't forget that, okay? That is the only one that is given either subcutaneously or IV because all insulins are given sub-Q. All right, very good. Moving right along. Um, prevention, 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 prevention. If you are a diabetic, the diabetes itself is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is maintaining stable blood sugars, blood sugars that aren't erratic, up and down, up and down. Because every time that happens, the sugar in the blood is just eating away at nerve endings and blood vessels. <sighs> Think about what sugar does to teeth, okay? That will help you better understand it. The key is having good control of the blood sugars, okay? And so when we talk about that, Let's talk about all the other things that can happen with patients as far as long-term complications. So we're gonna skip ahead, slide 52. And believe me, no one wants these. You have macro, large vessel, macrovascular changes, and then you have microvascular changes, which are little vessels. Stroke, heart attack, complications of diabetes. Microvascular changes, here are the three big ones. You must know these. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy, that's a loss of feeling in the lower extremities. Diabetic retinopathy, blindness, loss of vision, and diabetic nephropathy, kidney failure. More patients are on dialysis because of diabetes than any other reason. Type two, believe it or not, okay? So with these three microvascular changes, understand, 
every time sugar in the blood is high and it doesn't matter how long 10 minutes or an hour right but when all that sugar is floating through your blood your blood is flowing through your body the sugar is just eating away at these tiny nerve endings and blood vessels that's why the things that get affected are eyes kidneys and the part of the body that's furthest away from the trunk because it's the smallest blood vessels and nerves down at your feet right okay and so you know let's make sure that we understand the big issues with people and those long-term complications um infection secondary to the poor blood flow these patients if they get a wound it will take forever to heal and the longer a wound is open the higher the risk for infection makes sense right and then the other thing is and it starts with their feet 90 percent of the time it starts with their feet what do i mean they get a wound that they don't know is there because they can't feel it the wound gets infected and again they can't feel it so they don't know it's there and then it becomes so infected that the infection moves into the bone and the next thing you know it's gangrene and then they're rushed to the hospital and they're on IV antibiotics for months sometimes because of osteomyelitis and I'm going to put that in here I'm going to put non-healing wounds that lead to osteomyelitis okay? and then amputation so the reason that so many diabetics have amputations of the lower extremities toes feet or below the knee or above the knee amputations it's because of uncontrolled sugars that have destroyed the feet the nerve endings and the blood vessels in the feet and legs and they've gotten a wound that won't heal that became infected and the next thing you know it's infected beyond the point of no return and we have to amputate so this is this is the biggest problem with diabetics and the next page that is a diabetic foot ulcer and if you look she's already missing a toe okay so you know she's not doing well and this in, this is infected you've got some sloth and then you've got that black hard tissue that's called escar um it's not healing and doesn't look good either okay and so what must we teach diabetics about foot care and i will tell you that you will get asked questions about this in ati and the board of nursing they should inspect their feet every day top and bottom okay if they can't see the bottom of their feet because they're heavy or they have arthritis they can use a mirror to hold down there and look at the bottom of their feet to make sure there are no wounds they should wash and dry their feet every day and they can put lotion on their feet but not between their toes going to change this a little bit so i'm going to say wash and dry feet daily but do not soak people love to soak their feet i want to soak my feet in epsom salts no 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 soaking okay and the other thing is moisturize okay moisturize those feet but not never never between the toes because what will happen is it's a buildup of moisture and a fungus loves a dark moist warm environment they'll get a fungus between their toes the next thing you know the skin is cracked open open wound gets infected you know the story okay so they should always wear well-fitting shoes no sandals nothing with open toes they should never walk barefoot never never i'm going to put that in caps never barefoot never okay they should always try to protect their feet they shouldn't cross their legs or their ankles and here it says use caution with nail care mm, nah, nah. okay <clears throat> never whoops and this is in capitals too never cut their toenails okay you can use an emery board okay emery board is okay but if, if toenails need to be cut they must see a podiatrist which is a foot doctor okay make sure you know all this diabetic foot care you 
will get asked about it. I promise you, okay? Promise you, it is a given. They love, they meaning ATI and the Board of Nursing, okay? And the incidence of type 2 diabetes is just so elevated right now in this country that, you know, you need to know. So if a patient with diabetes must have surgery, you know, uh, of course, if they must have it, they must have it. But you want to make sure that they're going to have frequent glucose monitoring and they are going to be on insulin. Even if they're not on insulin at home, when they go into the hospital, the stress psychologically of being in the hospital, physiologically of having surgery, we're putting them on a sliding scale, okay? And they may say, I was never on insulin before. So you explain that this is temporary and it's because of all the stressors involved, okay? So that they understand that they're on insulin right now and, and you know, it's a temporary thing. Um, and we wanna make sure that their glucose doesn't go too high. The book here says 140 to 180. Understand something, a normal adult fasting blood sugar is 60 to 100. But when we're talking about people that are and have been diabetics, there's a little wiggle room there. If a diabetic wakes up with a blood sugar of 60, they're gonna have symptoms. They're gonna be shaky and maybe ready to lose consciousness, okay? So that's why the numbers for diabetics tend to run a little bit higher. 140 to 180 is good for a diabetic that's in the hospital, believe it or not. All right, you got your nursing diagnosis, risk for unstable blood glucose level, which is gonna to lead to non-healing wounds, non-healing incisional sites, okay? And then, you know, self-management and education. You know, the, the thing that they need to understand is if they just take care of themselves and keep their blood sugars stable, they can never have a complication ever. Go their whole lives with diabetes and just never have a complication. Um, they should understand the disease process and the treatment. When we talk about nutrition therapy, um, I'm gonna tell you this, and this is the key to life for everybody, not just diabetics, okay? Small, frequent meals, small, frequent meals. And also you want long acting carbs, which are complex carbohydrates. Ones that are brown, right? If they're brown, you're down. Okay. The white or simple carbs are the bad carbs. They are the sugars that will bam elevate the blood sugar for the patient immediately. They're in fast, they're out fast, but they can do a lot of damage. Okay. Exercise, how much should they exercise? What medications are they taking? And SMBG is self monitoring of blood glucose. And you wanna make sure they understand the complications, you know, and what can happen if they don't do what they're supposed to do. I promise they need to know. Um, reactive hypoglycemia. We're gonna talk about just for a quick second. And I'm gonna also put next to it the Simoji effect. That's a good spelling. Simoji effect. What that is, is it's an overreaction of the pancreas. So here's the scenario. Patient's supposed to have a bedtime snack because if blood sugar is gonna drop, it's gonna drop in the middle of the night because that's the longest period of time that we go without any food, okay? So in the middle of the night, blood sugar goes low, hypoglycemia, but patient sleeps through it. They wake up in the morning with this really super high blood sugar because their body reacts to the low blood sugar by doing whatever it can with a sympathetic response. So the liver will start putting out some sugar, the pancreas, you know, the body goes crazy basically is what you need to know. So what I call it is, I call it a rebound. This is gonna make it easy. Rebound, oops, hyperglycemia, okay? So in other words, sugar is low, during the night, but then elevated upon rising in the morning. And then, so the nurse will check the blood sugar and say, oh my God, blood sugar is high. What am I going to do? And they'll try to call the doctor and get an increase in insulin. And then the next day, the sugar's even higher. 
make sure that they're getting the right type of bedtime snack. It should be a complex carbohydrate, not a simple carb, so that it's gonna last them, carry them through the eight or 10 hours that they're sleeping at night so that they don't have this reactive hypoglycemia or Samoji effect or Samoji phenomenon is what it's called. So make sure you understand that. It's a rebound hyperglycemia. You don't increase their insulin. If you increase their insulin, their blood sugars will go up the next morning because of this body's crazy response, okay? All right, so make sure you know that. Um, and I think that that is it for this lecture. So if you have questions, that's what we're gonna do next. So guys, until next time, it was really nice sharing all this with you and I will see you with the next lecture. All right, bye.